Okay, so today we're going to talk about ATP, photosynthesis, and respiration. And I love the Amoeba Sisters and the little comics they create and the videos they create. So when comparing plant and animal cells, plant cells can do photosynthesis, but both plant and animal cells perform respiration. So let's discuss what that means. All right, so chemical energy. Um, chemical energy, you need to understand organisms use and store energy in the chemical bonds of organic compounds. So remember, it has to have carbon. Almost all the energy in organic compounds comes from the sun. Organisms obviously require a constant source of energy, and they need this to maintain homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis, what is that? It's the process of maintaining your internal order and balance whenever the environment changes. So if you are a warm-blooded organism, like we are, you have to maintain or, uh, homeostasis to keep that constant temperature. If you're cold-blooded, however, like a snake, you would become the temperature of the environment. And that is an adaptation um, that has occurred over time for you. But for us, we have to maintain that particular body temperature. We have to maintain the pH of our blood. This is all homeostasis. Okay, so some ways that cells are going to use energy is to maintain homeostasis. It's going to help them eliminate waste and take in food, like you see the fish there. Um, other uses will be for movement, for warmth, to create light, uh, like you see with the bug there. All right, so let's talk about photosynthesis. For photosynthesis, you are actually making glucose. It's the process by which plants, algae, some bacteria even, they use sunlight, they use carbon dioxide, and they use water, and they are going to produce glucose, which is sugar, and oxygen. Cellular respiration, however, is the total opposite of that. It's the process by which all living things use glucose and oxygen, and they produce carbon dioxide, water, and then we get energy out of it, which is ATP. So if um, photosynthesis is making glucose, then cellular respiration is breaking it. Very quickly, let's go ahead and let's compare photosynthesis to aerobic respiration, and we're going to do that by looking at the chemical formula for it. So the overall equation for photosynthesis is 6CO2, carbon dioxide, plus 6H2O, plus light energy, because you have to have the sun, and you're going to get C6H12O6, which is your sugar, plus 6O2, which is your oxygen. And the overall equation for cellular respiration, if you look, you start with C6H12O6, which is your sugar, and 6O2, which is your oxygen, and you are going to be given carbon dioxide, water, and then your energy, which is ATP. So the inputs for photosynthesis are the outputs for respiration and vice versa. So scientists have a tendency to say that photosynthesis is the opposite of cellular respiration. Now let's talk about what ATP is. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. That is the energy currency for organisms and cells. As food is slowly broken down, we have energy storing molecules created. So think of glucose like a $100 bill. It has a lot of value, but you can't use it to get a drink from the vending machine. Unfortunately, you have to break it down into usable pieces like a dollar bill. The ATP molecules are the usable change from the large valuable glucose molecules. So if you have one glucose molecule, then you have a whole bunch of ATP molecules that come out of that that you can use to get what you need. Okay, so we're going to look about how we form and break down ATP. But first, we need to understand how ATP is made. The structure of ATP consists of adenine, which is a nitrogenous base, ribose, which is sugar, and then three phosphates. So when we want to store energy, we take a single phosphate and we add it to ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. Okay, so ADP has two phosphates on it. If we want to release energy, then what we do is we take one phosphate off of ATP and that causes energy to be released. 
Okay, so let's look at what I just said in terms of a formula. ADP plus a random phosphate is going, with the use of energy, is going to give us ATP. Okay, so we're right here, ADP plus our phosphate. We are making, uh, the energy is making, energy making reaction is taking place, and then we get ATP as a result. However, if we want to break down ATP, so we start with it right here, we're going to use some of the energy, we're going to end up getting ADP and then a phosphate. And the little P I recommend uh, right here and here, that's just telling you that's just an independent phosphate. So what you need to know of this is that ATP is the main energy link between energy using reactions and energy making reactions. ATP is our energy currency. Okay, now let's, let's talk about photosynthesis, something that you've learned about in elementary school, but we're gonna go into more detail now. So what items are necessary for photosynthesis to occur? You have to have sunlight, you have to have carbon dioxide, and that is taken in by the stomata of the plant. You have to have water, and that is taken in by the roots. So two different locations are needed for photosynthesis to take place. What exactly is the role of pigments in photosynthesis? Well, in plants, light energy is harvested by those pigments, and they are located in the thycoloid membranes of the chloroplast. A pigment is a substance that can absorb a certain wavelength or a color of light, and it's gonna reflect all other colors. So let's talk for a little bit about light. Okay, so what you need to know is that we have a bunch of photosynthetic pigments here. You have probably heard of chlorophyll. But what you may not have heard is that there's chlorophyll A and there's a chlorophyll B. So let's go ahead and let's identify which one is which. So chlorophyll A is going to give us this yellow green. Okay, so let's put that right there. You can write, actually, no, let's do it this way. Okay, so we're gonna say chlorophyll A is yellow green. All right, and chlorophyll B is going to create blue-green. Okay, so what about the carotenoids? We have carotene and we have xanthophyll. Well, carotene is going to give us orange. Keratin is in a carrot. And xanthophyll is going to give us yellow. All right, so what happens with chlorophyll is it absorbs mostly the blue and the red light and it reflects green and yellow, and that's why uh, we see green. Okay, so photosynthesis, it takes place actually in two phases. On your paper, what you need to do is you need to write down um, right here in the drawing, you need to write down the light reaction and you need to write down the Calvin cycle. Okay, I'm not gonna go into tons of detail on either, um, but I am going to go into enough detail that you know what happens within these stages. So the light reaction, that is the photo part of photosynthesis. Makes sense since we're talking about light. So in the light reaction, the first part of photosynthesis, uh, light energy is converted to chemical energy in the form of ATP, and it's going to be used during the Calvin cycle. Chlorophyll traps energy from light by exciting the electrons. So that's what happens. The electrons absorb the energy and they leave. The electrons are passed along an electron transport chain within the thycoloid membrane, and it releases energy as it goes. This energy is given off from the electrons and is stored as ATP. Okay, so we're looking at, this is the um, electron transport chain, all kinds of crazy things happening here. 
You just need to know that an electron moves along it. All right, so photolysis is something that happens where water is split and oxygen is given off as waste into the atmosphere. Hydrogen bonds with NADP plus forming NADPH and that moves into the carbon cycle. So the light reaction um, has to get rid of the water molecule before the dark reaction can occur. Okay, so let's review what happens during the light reactions very quickly. It occurs in the chloroplast, which is the thycoloid membrane. Very important that you know that. Light reactions are going to take in water. They're going to release oxygen. They're going to send ATP and NADPH to the Calvin cycle. It does not take in carbon dioxide and it does not produce food. Okay, so this is the slide that is very important. Okay, this is what you need to study because you are going to see these questions. Now let's talk about the Calvin cycle, the second half of photosynthesis. It is the dark reaction because it doesn't require light. It is the synthesis part of photosynthesis, okay? And it's not going to take place in the same location as the light reaction. It actually takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast, not the thycoid membrane. Okay, so what you need to know is that carbon dioxide is taken in and it is fixed into a carbon molecule and that makes it usable for living things. With the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, ATP and NADPH from the light reaction is added to the, carbon, the Calvin cycle. So we knew that those were products of the light cycle, of the light reaction, and now we are adding them to uh, start our Calvin cycle. So there are several reactions that take place in this cycle. You are not expected to know them. Um, basically, all you need to know is that these reactants are turned into the products of simple sugars for the plant. Okay, so there are some factors that affect photosynthesis. One is light. In general, the rate of photosynthesis increases as light intensity increases until all the pigments in the chloroplast are being used. Okay, so three things affect it. Light, carbon dioxide, and temperature. And I need you to go ahead and draw the graphs that you see on your notes so that you can become familiar with them um, carbon dioxide, the concentration of carbon dioxide affects the rate of photosynthesis in a similar way of light. So that's why you see uh, the same graph basically. And if you recall from pH and enzymes, uh, not pH, uh, substrate concentration and enzymes, it's a similar graph. Temperature is, a, is, photosynthesis is most efficient with a certain temperature range. And the temperature range graph looks the same as it does for enzyme. So that should help you remember that. Okay, so we've talked about photosynthesis, but what about organisms, um, plants that don't use light? There are some bacteria that capture energy without using sunlight. They use inorganic compounds and they go through a process called chemosynthesis. In fact, they live in areas without oxygen too, and oxygen is even poisonous to them. And a good thing about this bacteria is that they can be used to break down sewage. Okay, so we've talked about photosynthesis. Now we're gonna talk in a little, real quickly about cellular respiration. You know, photosynthesis is um, the opposite of cellular respiration. So let's see what happens. All right, so the process of cellular respiration always begins with the process of glycolysis and that's gonna occur in the cytoplasm. Glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid, hydrogen ions, and electrons. Okay, and two molecules of ATP are used for this process, even though four of them are made. So four are made, but to start it off, you have to use energy. So you start off negative, and then you add four, and you become positive again. So the net product, we say the net product of glyco at glycolysis is two ATP. Because remember, cellular respiration, the whole purpose is to create energy. We're creating ATP molecules. All right, so we have aerobic respiration. 
and if op oxygen is available to the cell, then glycolysis is followed by the citric acid cycle, which we call the Krebs cycle, and that occurs in the mitochondria. The total energy storing products from one time through the, through the Krebs cycle is going to give you one ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2. And these are all different uh, molecules of energy. It's going to move through the electron transport chain and electron carriers produced during the Krebs cycle are going to transfer energy throughout the train, the chain. And this is where you're getting most of your ATP from. You get 34 ATP molecules. So you get a lot from the electron transport chain. So with glycolysis and the electron transport chain, which we call ETC, because in science, if we can abbreviate something, we're going to, you get 36 ATP created from one glucose molecule. So you get a lot of energy. And this is just a diagram showing you the electron transport chain and all the crazy things that happen, but you do not have to know the details of that. Now, that's with aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration, on the other hand, you don't get as much. So if oxygen isn't available, anaerobic respiration follows glycolysis. So in both scenarios, glycolysis starts. In anaerobic respiration, you get fermentation. And fermentation takes place in the cytoplasm, so it's not even occurring in the same location. And depending on the type of organism, one or two types of fermentation is going to occur. You're going to have alcoholic fermentation, and that's going to produce alcohol and occurs in bacteria and yeast, and that's how our bread is made. Or you're going to have lactic acid fermentation, and that produces lactic acid in some bacteria and sometimes in animal cells. So this is an example of alcoholic fermentation. Um, when cells don't receive enough oxygen, because if you're running up the stairs because you're late to class and, you know, we're on the third floor, uh, your cells switch from aerobic respiration to lactic acid fermentation. And if you ever feel that burn, that buildup, and it makes your legs feel sore, that is lactic acid fermentation. So you need to know that your body doesn't have enough energy to go through the process that you're going through right now. So fermentation is a much less efficient process, and it only occurs... Uh, it's only going to produce two ATP from glycolysis. So let's think, do we want to get 36 or do we want to get two? I don't know about you, but I'm not a fan of my legs burning when I'm running up the steps because I'm late. And that's all you need to know about photosynthesis and cellular respiration.